All right. Uh, this is uh, we like uh, we're with that. We'll start with um, Michael Ambrose, who gets off to a good start. Thank you. So I'm here to tell you about the AMP Lab and specifically one project pickle, which allows developers to build applications that can query ever growing amounts of data while still guaranteeing consistent performance. So just to give you a little motivation here, websites grow really quickly. So this graph you're looking at here is actually the number of tweets per day on the website Twitter. And as you can see, they've been growing exponentially since the year 2007. So while this is great for their employees and their future stockholders, uh, it sometimes results in disaster. So this is, this is the fail whale. This is what happens when Twitter servers get overloaded. And this is kind of a common pattern. We like to call it a success disaster, where your website is so popular that the, the flood of users actually degrades a previously good user experience. So kind of the common pattern to solve this has been this thing called the NoSQL movement. So the idea with NoSQL is we're going away from traditional databases and we're forcing developers to use simple get and put operations against a key value store. And I have some pictures of some kind of common examples of this. Uh, the nice thing about this is it makes complexity obvious to the developer. You realize if you're scanning over all of the users in an application, that's probably not going to be scalable when you get up to tens of millions of users. Kind of the downside of this is you're forcing users to use only simple operations. And this is kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So you're losing optimization, so you're forcing your developers to reason about the fastest way to run a query instead of letting the database do it for them. And you're also losing data independence. So this means that when you change the data layout or you add an index, you actually have to go back and rewrite your application, once again, instead of letting the database do it for you. So instead, we have a solution called Pickle. It stands for the Performance Insightful Query Language. And it's a SQL-like language that builds on top of these existing key value stores. So you still get your high productivity SQL language, but we are going to guarantee performance independent of scale. Now, this is more than uh, just saying no to queries that aren't going to scale. It's actually a fundamental rethinking of the objective function for optimization. So to make this concrete, let's look at an example from the website Twitter that actually caused problems in production. So when I go to look at the AMP Labs profile, one of the things they'll show you is the, the people who I'm following that also follow the AMP Lab. When the database is trying to decide how to run this query, it has a couple of options, and it decides between them based on response time. One option would be to do a sequential scan, and as you can see, here's the performance for a sequential scan as the user base grows. And another is to do a random lookup. The way the database decides between these two plans is looking at the number of followers an average user has, and then deciding, well, clearly, the sequential scan is going to be faster. The problem with this is when you get a more popular user like Lady Gaga, who has 19 million followers, the response time goes through the roof. So this is just one project in the AMP Lab that's trying to make it easier for developers to make sense of big data. Kind of the key idea here is we want to allow them to use resources like algorithms, machines, and people all together. Well, there have been a lot of sol point solutions that deal with one of these axes, like MATLAB and R let you write good, cool machine learning algorithms, as Mike Jordan just talked about. Uh, you can leverage people and the knowledge of the crowd on websites like Yelp or Mechanical Turk, which gives you an API for that. And things like Hadoop and Oracle let you leverage large numbers of machines. Instead, oh, and then there's all, a couple of solutions that, uh, that kind of use two of these axes, but none that use all three. Instead, the AMP Lab wants to take a holistic approach that kind of combines all of these three resources easily for developers. So we're actually building software, as Mike Jordan said before. It's called the Berkeley Data Analysis System, and it's a, a bottom-to-top rethinking of the software stack. If you'd like to learn more about the Pickle and the projects that make up the, uh, the, big, the Berkeley Big Data Analytics System, uh, come to our poster session in the AMP Lab, uh, 465 Soto Hall today. Thank you. All right, I'm Ben Likely, and today I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about what the Center for Hybrid and Embedded Software Systems does in general, and the project that I'm working on in, in particular. So I'd, before I get started, I'd also like to point out that this particular project is actually a joint work between myself and my advisor, Edward Lee, and two researchers from Bosch Research. So this is actually an example of academia industry joint work. Um, so before I get into it, I'd just like to talk about what embedded systems are. And I, I like to think of them as the computers that you don't think of as computers. The, the software that goes inside cars, trucks, trains, medical systems, nuclear power plants, military systems, 
all these things where we, we tend to generally think of the system first without even necessarily re remembering that there's software inside. But this is very important software, and oftentimes it has really critical um, safety important features. So just a, a couple of examples of cases where um, what can go wrong. On the right, you see the Ariane 5 rocket. This is a video of its maiden voyage. And well, so far so good. And then it explodes uh, in the middle of flight. And, and what happened here was that a component was reused from the Ariane 4 rocket that uh, assumed that the altitudes were 16-bit integers. And in the Ariane 5, they were less resource constrained. They upgraded that to a 64-bit floating point number. But um, this, this caused a problem once you got to the altitude at which it couldn't be represented in a 16-bit integer, and it just um, crashed. The Mars Climate Orbiter had a, a similar type of problem that it was interfacing related, where there were problems interfacing uh, in the units to talk about what the forces were, where one was measuring in newtons and another in pound forces. And this caused the orbiter that was supposed to take pictures of the Martian climate from orbit to descend too low and disintegrate in the atmosphere. Um, so the idea of our research is to be able to let the, the designers and the model builders as a step in their analysis to specify what types of information that they want to analyze. So they can build these what we call ontologies, which are just representations of what type of information they want to talk about, and then run an automated algorithm that can check throughout their code, throughout their models, that these are being used in a consistent way and alert them to problems if um, they're not being used consistently. So here are some examples of ontologies for checking units, like newtons and, and pound forces, or for checking kind of the, the bit widths of different numeric types in like a, a C-like language. Um, so that, that's, that's my project. There are a lot of other projects going on at Chess. Um, another example of, of something that requires analysis, rather than the analysis between different components, is an analyzing how long software takes to run. And Game Time is a project under Prof. Sanjit Seshia and his students that takes a, a game theory and probabilistic approach to determining what the worst case execution times of different pieces of software are um, using kind of combinations of different paths through the software in order to, even though it can't exhaustively explore all possible paths through software systems, to be able to prove bounds on close to, provably close bounds to the, the worst case execution times. And um, so in chess, we're not, only working on these analysis problems. We also have a lot of work on modeling embedded systems, especially hybrid systems that have both software and real world's physical dynamics, um, designing systems, especially programming um, distributed systems, and, um, and analyzing these, coming up with new architectures that support uh, more precise timing um, so if you're interested in kind of any of these domains related to cyber physical systems, I encourage you to come to our open house, which is on the fifth floor of Corey Hall and um, 540AB, and we'll have an uh, open house and a lunch there. Thanks. All right, uh, good morning. Um, so my name is uh, Tristan Rushlow, and uh, I'm working with uh, Clark Nguyen's group. Uh, in the field of RF MEMS, specifically RF MEMS resonators, which uh, offer some exciting potential to replace some conventional um, RF communication technology. So first, I'm representing BSAC, which is the Berkeley Sensors and Actuators uh, Center. So BSAC um, is primarily focused on MEMS and sensors, um, but there's a real wealth of different projects, everything from bio-MEMS to uh, photonics-type applications. Uh, so I really can't do justice for the, the, the variety of projects, but there will be posters this afternoon. Um, I would encourage you guys all to come. Okay, so a little motivation for the work that, uh, that I do in uh, Clark Nguyen's lab. Um, you all have uh, uh, communication devices, you know, uh, cell phones, consumer electronics. Every single one of these devices has quartz resonators. Um, you know, this is a typical device here, or, or equivalent resonators like saw resonators. Um, in order to do timing and oscillators and uh, RF filters and the like. Now, a typical resonator might be three millimeters on a side, like so, which sounds small, um, but on a modern cell phone, that still actually takes up a fair amount of space. Now, next generation devices, um, you know, your new cell phone is going to have to do everything. It's going to be a cell phone, it's going to be an internet device, it's going to be a GPS unit. 
Every single one of these capabilities, every single additional uh, RF channel, requires additional resonators in order to achieve um, filters and oscillators. When you try to dram all of these into a single device, that takes up a lot of space. It becomes very bulky, and it costs a lot of money. OK, so enter RF MEMS resonators. Uh, the beauty of RF MEMS resonators is that we can fabricate individual MEMS resonators on a single chip. Here's a typical device here um, of a sizing about 30 microns on a side. Uh, and we can put many of these on a die of different frequencies, different, uh, you know, different, different devices, and put a single die and replace an entire combination of many different quartz resonators. Uh, thus saving significant amounts of space and uh, money. OK, so I'll just talk a little bit about the devices that we actually make. Um, we do capacitive gap MEMS resonators. Uh, and a capacitive gap MEMS resonator consists of a, of a disk of material. This is an SEM of a resonator here, which is actually freestanding with very tight capacitive gaps shown schematically here uh, to input and output electrodes. By applying a bias voltage to the disk and driving it with an AC signal, we can cause the device to resonate like so in plane. That resonance, that motion, then modulates the capacitance on the output electrode, which then produces an output current. Because this is driven and measured electronically, it has a direct analog to an RLC circuit in a schematic-based uh, system. That means you can put these as a drop-in replacement for anywhere that you would need an RLC circuit, such as, for instance, oscillators and filters. Now, the advantage of the technology we do um, is uh, twofold. First, we can achieve very high Q factors, or quality factors. Um, and that's very, that's important, uh, that, that determines um, how good of a filter or an oscillator you can make in many ways. Um, and the second one is we can generate many different devices on a single device, a die uh, with, uh, with different sizes. The size is actually determined by the radius of its disk, so we can have many frequencies on a single run or a single wafer. So uh, I'll just show you an image of a typical device that would illustrate some of the work that we're currently doing. Uh, this is a, a disk device that I was talking about here. In this case, it's actually made of diamond. This is the disk here, the resonance structure. You can see a zoom in here, these little one micron crystals. We find diamond is a really superior material in terms of uh, achieving very high quality factors and high frequency. Uh, we operate in the, the gigahertz of frequencies as our current, um, our current efforts. Uh, and you can see here also a, a zoom in of the capacitive gap used to actuate these things. They're very small in order to achieve good coupling. Uh, so just a couple words on the applications that we're currently looking at. Uh, first is oscillators. Um, in order to achieve an oscillator, you would use one of these MEMS devices as a feedback element in an amplifier loop. If you have sufficient gain, you can generate consistent oscillation, and um, this can be done on chip, so it's very compact. And the other main application we're looking at right now is filters. By coupling several devices, individual resonators with coupling beams, you can control the coupling beam length, and uh, by doing so, you can generate very, very narrow band passband filters. Here's some example from some previous work we've been doing. We're attempting to develop this at higher frequency and with narrower passbands. Anyway, that's just a, a quick summary of some of the things we do. If you want to know more about this work or any of the other work that BSAC does, I'd encourage you to come to the poster session. Uh, that's going to be in Cori here, just a quick map that's across campus. And uh, we're going to be on the fourth floor of Cori. Uh, this is just a floor plan here. These are the elevators. So if you come off the elevators, it'll be to the left and the right of you in the conference room and the swarm lab. Hope to see you there. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Venkatesan from Wireless Foundations. And on behalf of the faculty and students at WIFO, I extend a warm welcome to all of you. So at Wireless Foundations, we work on a wide range of topics aimed at enhancing next generation communication systems. Uh, our main focus is on developing theory and algorithms for many applications, such as cyber physical systems, distributed storage, 3D modeling, smart grids, and so on. So I'll give a brief overview of some of these projects. And I encourage you to come to our poster session to know more about the rest of the projects. So in the context of large-scale peer-to-peer uh, systems, one of the applications that we are looking at is in scalable content delivery. So as most of you know, uh, more than 60% of the current internet traffic is uh, based on video. And in order to support applications such as live uh, video streaming or video on demand, we need to uh, provide a scalable architecture so that we can guarantee the delay and latency requirements of these systems. So some of the questions that we are looking at is in how can we use some cache nodes, and how how, what sort of load balancing algorithms that can be used, what sort of routing algorithms that can be used, are some of the challenges that we are looking at in this particular application. Further, in this era of big data, distributed storage is one of the uh, main challenges. So when you have a large peer-to-peer -peer network, and you have many nodes failing, and many nodes 
joining the system at random times. The question is, how do you maintain the reliability of the data in the system? So we have been developing physical layer codes that can provide security and reliability guarantees for data storage in the network. And at the same time, they are very much network and bandwidth efficient. One of the other projects that uh, one of the groups is looking at is then cognitive radio. So cognitive radio essentially allows for efficient use of the spectrum by having multiple users coexist on the same frequency band. For example, you could have uh, white space networks in the TV bands, uh, wherein you try to uh, support the primary user, that is the TV station, and in order to provide guarantees for him, you allow for a guard band or a guard region around the TV station, and you can have other networks, such as, uh, say, vehicular networks that can coexist on the same band outside this particular guard band. So now the question is, given these constraints, what are the sort of capacity or what is the optimal capacity of these networks is one of the uh, research questions that we are looking at. So obviously, the capacity for these networks would depend upon what sort of sharing rules that you have and what sort of guarantees that you want to give for the primary user. And in such cases, we also need to look at developing the kind of sharing rules for these networks, not only from the end user's perspective, but also from the perspective of agencies like the FCC and the Congress. And so we have, we have been looking at developing such sharing rules that are fair enough for the users and at the same time looking at algorithms that allow for uh, enforcing these rules efficiently. The other project that some of the groups are working on is in smart grids. So smart grids essentially allow for uh, efficient management of uh, electrical power transfer over large networks. And so we are looking at optimal power flow algorithms in these networks. Further, given that renewable energies are forming a major source of the electrical energy in the current day systems, the question is, how do you uh, have better demand response management by providing incentives to users? So is one of the other questions that we are looking at from a network economics point of view. One of the other projects that uh, one of the groups are working on is in loss differentiation in wireless networks. So we, when we have multiple uh, devices coexisting on the same band, like for example, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, the question is, can we have some more additional information at every particular node, which is not just the local information, but can allow for a better routing and better usage of the resources? So we're looking at what sort of uh, information that needs to be exchanged amongst nodes that are li lying in the, on the same network that can allow for efficient use of the network. So that's one of the other projects that we are looking at here. So these are some of the sample projects that uh, we are uh, working on, and there are po post topics on other topics, such as uh, robust positioning for transportation systems, indoor navigation, uh, private queries for audio stream search, how can we use physical layer codes to have uh, improve the queuing delay in data centers, and uh, using uh, how can we improve map reduce using uh, physical layer codes, or some of the other projects that we are looking at. And so I extend a warm welcome to all of you to come to our uh, open house, which is from 2 to 4. And it's in 264 Corey Hall, and we are located right behind the EEC main office. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jason Traeger. I am representing Citrus today. Uh, for those of you who do not know, Citrus is the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society. It is a multidisciplinary center spanning across a wide range of subject areas. And what I will present for you today is an overview and a little bit of my research with some graphs that you might like. So Citrus, like I said, uh, big acronym, big name. Um, and the mission is to shorten the pipeline between innovation and industry. So there's a lot of industry folks, a lot of people who might be in the startups here. Citrus has had 35 startups come out of uh, research there. And it is empowering the University of California by tackling problems in the social areas, the healthcare fields, and in environmental research. Um, so, little picture slides of what we do. Uh, Citrus deals with big data and complex computing. Uh, we deal with representation of that data and how to cluster and aggregate data. There are sub-research groups that specialize this. Uh, Ken Goldberg and the Berkeley Center for New Media does this. Um, good guy. Uh, telehealth. Citrus has many, many healthcare initiatives, and there's a lot of research talks on Wednesdays at noon, if you're interested, that specialize in health. Check that out on the Citrus website. Um, this here is a moat that's used to monitor the health of the water ecosystem in California. Uh, there is a large initiative to be aware. We use 20% 20 uh, 20 of our power in California to move water. That's an important resource. And then there's energy resources, advanced meter in infrastructure that needs analytics that big data uh, will empower. 
And so I'm going to talk about a little bit of what I do, uh, what we are doing. And this is a graph of the plug loads in Citrus every hour of the day, every day in October on one graph. As we can see through the center of the graph, there is the work day when the graduate students wake up late, come in, and do your research. Um, the magnitude of the power draw is represented by the color. And so, here on the ends, we are doing nothing, and yet we are drawing 30 kilowatts in plug loads. Here, in the middle, we're doing a lot, and we're drawing an even higher peak. And so what we are working on, and the value of doing it, is the specific project of distributed intelligent automated demand response. We use big data, sensing, and control, combine them, we're achieving, aiming to achieve a 30% peak power reduction in the building by moving around loads. The value of this is the ability across the globe to shift billions of tons of CO2, create millions of green collar jobs, and in fact, doing it is not it. What we need to be doing is doing nothing well. Nothing well. And so, in my research, I use mobile phone apps to gather data on devices, represent that data to users. And as we represent that data, we can help those users achieve control of those devices. Beyond that, we make them accept the fact that we might be turning off some of their devices so that everyone can save power. And that, to me, uh, as a sustainability uh, guy, is very important. And so, I can't go over all the stuff I do and all the stuff that Citrus does in a short time, um, but I can show you what it means for big data. Here is an electrical tree of Satarja Dai Hall. And here is the first graph on the second floor of Satarja Dai Hall, the plug loads in October, and the third floor, and the fourth floor, and the fifth floor, and the sixth floor, and the seventh floor. We can both dig deep and have a breadth of data to analyze, and to that, um, I would encourage you to come speak to us. We're having uh, lunch after this and then an open house from two to four. If you go to the lobby of Satarja Dai Hall, you will find where we are. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve. Uh, thanks, Jason. And like you said, my name is Steve Dawson Haggerty, and I'm here today representing the Locale Project, which is a project run by uh, Randy Katz, David Culler, and Seth Sanders in the East Department. And the core of the idea of the Locale Project is to try to build energy networks. And this is a really nice follow-up of Jason's talk, because what I'm going to talk about is a bunch of infrastructure work we've done in the project in order to enable these energy networks. The key idea drive, motivating us to try to build these is that as renewables uh, increase on the grid, we become sort of less and less able to manage the electric, electricity grid by turning, down, turning generation to match demand, and instead we're going to need to modulate demand to match supply. Um, and so the Locale Project has a number of efforts in sort of systems analysis and uh, understanding the actual loads in order to allow us to actually do this. There's sort of three main focus areas in, when it comes to actually controlling different loads to uh, actually make them more responsive. And a big one of them is the cyber physical building. And, this, and buildings are a really important place to do this because there's so much of the electricity load. It's estimated to be about 40% of the US um, electricity is spent in commercial buildings. And it's also a big challenge. So what we have on the right is sort of a traditional schematic of a commercial building. And one way to think of a building is a plant for manufacturing an environment for its occupants. Um, and the way it's done now is there are multiple separate systems inside of the plant, the electric system, the HVAC system, the transportation system, that are all working together, but relatively uncoordinated and relatively um, independently in order to, to provide this system. To the extent that there is coordination, it's typically provided through a building management system. What we like is to move to a world where this is a much more open, flexible, dynamic architecture where we have applications running on the building, providing services like tuning the atmosphere to the number of occupants in the building, um, allowing you to take occupant feedback, allowing fault detection to really um, perform well in these buildings because a big problem is that things break and nobody knows. And so a lot of the focus of my research has been on this interface between the applications and the actual physical building to allow us to do sort of scalable, portable applications. 
the framework we've come up with is sort of schem um, a schematicized here, and the core of it all is the data, the, the instruments, the sensors, the actuators that are coming out of the building, that's this incredible diversity of instrumentation in, in existing buildings dating back 100 years almost. Um, and that's this bottom piece here of instruments. And flowing from the instruments, we flow into the rest of the application infrastructure. And a big, but a big part of the work has been wrapping up all, those, all that diversity into a simple, um, easy to understand, easy to program framework for application writers. The other pieces here are the repository, which in the process control work is sometimes, world is sometimes known as a historian. That's where you put the data so you can get it back. And then on the left, we have the applications, which I was talking about, the things, the things we want to enable. And so here's an example of some of the stuff we've wrapped up from our buildings. And this is just sort of to give you an example of the incredible diversity and heterogeneity that's, that's present in the built environment. We have everything from legacy Modbus meters to SCADA meters, which we pull in over BACnet or RS-45, to state-of-the-art six low-pan wireless meters, all being sucked into a common format and, and made available for application writers. And so one question you might ask is, is this big data? Is the data big enough? Because any of these individual sensors, you take a room temperature or a room set point, doesn't change that quickly. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is a typical commercial building, like one of our test buildings, has about 6,000 points. We sample about 1,000 of them at subhertz frequencies. But this graph here shows the write rate over into our repository on a typical day. And you can see, even when we're not doing anything, this is when we're importing data, even when we're just running, from, from sort of two buildings, we're getting a write rate of about 300 points a second. And this is forever, so the data is not going to go away. You either have to degrade it or archive it, and you certainly have to compress it. And so part of the effort has been building tools to allow us to access all that data quickly and efficiently. Another key problem that I'm just going to touch on briefly is the metadata problem. And this is sort of the problem of how do things evolve. And one way to think of it is there are actually multiple views of your commercial building, and that's what this slide is, slide is showing. On one hand, there's the physical view, the operations view of where the floors are and where the walls are. But an entirely separate view is the process view of the, for instance, the HVAC or the lighting system, because there's a loop and different components in the system, which overlaps, is present in physical space, but isn't a particular one. And finally, there's the electrical system. So part of our work has been able, has been to capture and, and present this to users and applications in particular in a very, uh, conducive way to ex extending it. And so one of our contributions is that sort of a domain-specific language for generating these different slices of your building um, from, from the metadata. And so finally, if you, if you uh, are interested in this, if you come back to our poster session, which will be in the Wozniak Lounge in Soda Hall, or our lunch, which will be in 380 Soda Hall. Sorry, the slide is a little unclear on that point. Um, we'll have a lot of examples of applications, so model predictive HVAC controls. This is a test bed we did where you can completely control the HVAC system in one part of Quarry Hall, um, a personalized lighting control, uh, adding privacy to this. And with that, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Hi there. Uh, I'm Chris Fallon. I'm a sixth year with the Department of Film, excuse me, Film and Media, but also representing the Berkeley Center for New Media. So the Berkeley Center for New Media is a little different than most of the stuff that you've been hearing about in that we try and bring together and represent people from virtually every department on campus. So we have humanists, social scientists, and scientists all sort of working together to critically analyze and understand technology and its impact for society and the public interest. Um, as part of that, we have a range of projects that go on, looking at questions related to technology, games, race, ethnicity, um, problems related to the, the digital divide and the digital skills gap, and the way that all these things sort of affect how we relate socially. Uh, the project that I'm going to look, tell you a little bit about more today is data journalism. Uh, data journalism is exactly what it sounds like. It's sort of the combination of big data and the traditional field of journalism. It's sort of grown up in the last decade as more news organizations have embraced data as a source of information for doing the job that they've always been doing. Uh, chief among them, the New York Times and The Guardian, have really been at the forefront. Uh, but then it's also the way that different tools have grown up and emerged as a way of, of broadening access to sort of data analysis and visualization. And then uh, finally, a key piece of the puzzle is the emergence of stories that really require those tools to, to even understand what the event is all about. And uh, WikiLeaks is sort of a good example of that. 
Um, on the back end, data journalism involves a process that I'm sure many of you are sort of familiar with. That is, you determine which data you want to analyze, you aggregate a given data, data set or sets, and then you, you know, set about cleaning it up, filtering it, and making it meaningful for the sort of results that you want to get at. Um, in relation to scientific and business contexts, that's not always a, a straightforward process, but at least you have a, a given goal or set of outcomes that you want to look at. When you put that into a political or a social context, obviously things get a little more controversial and a little less clear. So I'm trying to understand how those decisions are made and what criterion are used to sort of get at some sort of objective result. Um, and then the other thing is looking at it from sort of an audience perspective. Um, here we have two images that represent uh, civilian casualties in Iraq. And one is sort of the traditional way of picturing events like this, and the other is sort of the data journalist's view on looking at that. And obviously, they both represent information of a given sort, and we don't need to sort of choose between one or the other, but I'm sort of trying to get at and understand what's hidden and what's revealed in one or the other. And I think we as, you know, your average audience member is very good at looking at a picture and saying, you know, this is one view, certain things are hidden, certain things are revealed. I understand you know, there's a certain level of trust, but also a certain level of skepticism. Uh, but we don't have quite that same level of fluency yet on a general level with something like the image on the left. Um, so uh, this is a slide. Uh, sorry, it should, OK. Well, it's an, it's an animation of every sort of conflict within the uh, Afghanistan war over the course of eight years. And I'm interested, if we think of journalism as sort of, you know, what it's traditionally been thought of as the first draft of history, how, uh, you know, if we can represent things like eight years of conflict on, you know, in a given minute, uh, how that will in turn affect how we make decisions in the future about these types of conflicts, but then also how we'll look back on these events and sort of work to understand and represent them. So. Um, that's just one of sort of many questions that my group works on. And we're in the fourth floor of Sitarjadai Hall. And we'll be there from 2 to 4. So we'd love to have you all come by if you're interested in sort of thinking about your field or your work from sort of a, meta, a more meta level. Thank you. Hi, my name is Victor Xia, and I'm a second year in the Teleimmersion Lab, which is headed by Professor Virginia Baichi. So the Teleimmersion Lab is primarily uh, deals with research in developing technologies to allow people in this different locations to interact with each other in a teleimmersive um, 3D virtual reality environment. So what we've done in the past is, in collaboration with um, uni uh, UIUC, um, we've actually been able to have people dance together. And uh, also in, co in collaboration with UC Davis, we've done virtual geology and virtual archaeology, where you can actually be in this environment and interact with virtual objects. And recently, we've um, begun a collaboration with Dr. Jay Han from UC Davis to allow doctors to install um, uh, these devices in, in um, patients' homes in order to interact with them in a different environment. So what I do is a slightly different. It has to do with human-in-the-loop control. And so control theory is, um, deals with developing safe controllers um, for dynamical systems. But the problem is once you insert a human into the equation, everything can break down because humans are a little bit unpredictable. But in certain circumstances, such as driving, you can kind of predict what a person is doing. So the question is, can we develop safe control algorithms to keep systems safe while incorporating this human input? So just some past work that's been done in, the past, um, in terms of driving. So as we all know, there's been the autonomous car. And the California Path was actually one of the first um, players in this game, and they show in the 80s. And um, this was followed by Dar the DARPA Grand Challenge, as well as the Google car, which um, followed up on the results of the Grand Challenge. But as Professor Tomlin mentioned earlier, one of the issues with this is you can't model the entire universe. And as a result, it's hard to guarantee the safety of such systems. And industry, also knowing this, um, has gone the route of semi-autonomous uh, cars. So Volvo, this is, a, I think, the Volvo car, where they employed an automated assisted braking. So the car has a forward uh, front-facing radar. And if, you, if it detects an object or a person in front of it, and the person hasn't stopped in time, it will automatically brake for the driver. 
Um, one issue with this Volvo car, though, is it only works at low speeds. I think they rated it up to 30 miles per hour. And one of the reasons why it doesn't work at higher speeds is this car, the radar looks at the worst case scenario of the car. And at higher speeds, that worst case scenario gets huge. So this is where driver modeling can come in. If we have an idea of what the person can do, can we actually improve this semi-autonomous control structure? So what we've done is develop a model for the driver over, over time by observing what the driver does, apply this to the semi-autonomous control structure, and we've shown that this actually can improve this, um, this architecture. So in our lab, we have an experimental setup, a driving simulator, and in the top left, um, you can see a, uh, there's a driver with um, a bunch of red LEDs. Essentially, we have a motion capture to recreate a skeleton, which you can see in the top right. Um, so we pretty much get observations of the driver through this method. And we've I, I'll just point to two different models that we've created. The first one is there is no model. It's just we just look at the worst case scenario for the car. And if you look on the, the two images on the top row, um, it's, it gets pretty large. But the second model that we've created correlates what the person has done in the past two seconds, if he has two, two hands on a steering wheel or if he's on the cell phone or something, and, also, and correlates what the future looks like, what the future environment looks like. It correlates both of those things to what the person is likely to do in the future. And if you look at the bottom row, the, first, the, first, the left image shows um, what this prediction set looks under normal driving. It's actually pretty tight, which indicates that it's the prediction. It thinks that the human, the driver, is going to stay within those bounds. But when the person is distracted, those bounds increase because the system is a little bit more unsure of what the person is likely to do. So um, in terms of metrics, um, one, one question is, how good is this prediction? Um, and we can actually see that uh, although the accuracy does drop a little bit, the bounds, which we, we denote as precision, actually the bounds of the prediction are a lot better. And then one idea is um, to take, if, the, if these bounds intersect with an obstacle, then we want to take over in, in order to maintain safety of the, the vehicle. So this is where we call, um, these are the two metrics, the recall and the precision of the intervention function. And we show that the worst case scenario, which is model one, takes over far too often, while our model actually takes over, doesn't take over as often, which is good, but it takes over when necessary. So in conclusion, we show that driver modeling can actually improve the performance for the semi-autonomous control structure. And currently, where this relates to big data is we're trying to learn this model in real time. And thank you for listening. Uh, so our lab is located in 475 um, Hearst Memorial Building, and we'll have poster sessions from 2 to 315. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah Bird, and I'm representing the Parallel Computing Laboratory. Uh, hmm. There we go. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a spectrum of projects in the PAR lab, uh, all kind of in the area of dynamic optimization for interactive computing systems. And so as we all know, the multi-core revolution has happened. Parallel computing is uh, practically ubiquitous everywhere. And uh, it's, you know, the industry, it's really the only way forward for them unless you're happy with the way your programs ran in 2008. Unfortunately, uh, parallel programming is still really challenging. It's um, a lot harder than sequential programming. And so the point of the PAR lab is to really try to harness the power of parallel computing uh, for client applications. So we're working with uh, all sorts of people in the, uh, in the computing stack. The PAR lab, uh, the goal is to bridge the gap between parallel hardware and users. And so we have 14 faculty in the lab and way more graduate students working all the way from parallel hardware, on parallel software, on applications, and uh, trying to represent users. And so we take an application-driven approach in PAR lab where we work with the application experts and see uh, for future compelling applications what they really need and use that to redesign the entire computing stack to get productivity and efficiency. So one of the most compelling applications we have in the PAR lab right now is work on a pediatric MRI. And if you ever had an MRI, you know the exam takes an hour, it's in a very cramped uh, lab tube, and unfortunately motion blurs images, so you have to stay still for that entire hour, and it's a very uncomfortable 
uncomfortable experience. Now, it, and it's, it's particularly difficult for, I mean, it's difficult for me to stay still. It's particularly difficult for children to stay still. So the traditional approach has been um, to use anesthesia and put the children to sleep. However, this is invasive and it's risky, and so it really limits the amount of times a, a doctor will choose to do an MRI. Now there's a new uh, MRI algorithm called compressed sensing that uh, would allow us to reduce each scan uh, to 15 seconds, which is uh, a time period in which someone could just uh, stay still without having, you know, even a child, without having to be put to sleep. And this was pretty interesting for uh, the researchers at, at Stanford in the Stanford Children's Hospital shown here who were working with this uh, and our Berkeley researchers. Unfortunately, the problem with this approach is that it takes too long um, to reconstruct the image on the order of hours. And this isn't clinically feasible because when the, uh, the technician has no idea if the scan was good and if the child needs to be rescanned, and so it just uh, wasn't feasible at all. However, with the help of our ParLab researchers who uh, took advantage of what they've learned about parallel patterns of computation and wrote, uh, ported the uh, application to GPUs, uh, we were actually able to take the image reconstruction down from an hour to two hours to less than a minute. Uh, which makes it actually clinically feasible. And now you can go from something like the picture on the left here, which is a scan of 15 seconds, but uh, with a traditional reconstruction technique, to something on the right, which is much clearer, even if maybe you can't see it on the screen here. But it's much clearer. It's uh, actually able to diagnose where traditionally uh, the other image was not. My research is a little bit on the other end of the spectrum. I'm lower down in the computing stack. And I work on solving the problem of if I'm running a bunch of applications at once on my multi-core device, how do I guarantee interactivity? So say I'm watching a video, but I'm also doing some computation for my research. Of course, the computation is really important and I want it to get done, but I don't want my video to skip. So I have a resource allocation framework that's designed to make sure that applications don't miss their deadlines by dividing up the hardware resources appropriately. And the idea is a flawless user experience while maximizing the battery life for mobile devices. Now, there's a whole, Heart Lab is very large, and there's a whole bunch of other interesting work. We've got communication avoiding linear algebra, which is really great work where these, they're getting orders of magnitude speed up over already optimized code. We have awesome music uh, application that works with uh, new user interfaces to make computer music. Our CGITS project uh, is a dynamic optimization that allows you to get the, uh, uh, the performance of highly optimized C, but the productivity of writing in Python, which is really exciting. So the Parallel Computing Laboratory Forward, we're kind of looking at the future of personal computing, things such as uh, data security or how to dynamically split between the client and the cloud. And so there's a lot of exciting research to come as well. Uh, so come join us for lunch. There's going to be an open house. We're on the fifth floor of Soda Hall. There'll be a, a, here's a lot of posters that are listed, and there'll be more. So uh, thanks, and I uh, hope to see you at ParLab. Hi, I'm uh, Timmy Xiao, and I'm with the uh, Berkeley Laboratory for Automation Science and Engineering. Uh, we work on a very diverse set of projects um, in collaboration with the Berkeley Center for New Media and uh, UCSF. So one of the things that uh, we've been working on is a system called Opinion Space, which is a distributed system for um, viewing and rating comments to find insightfulness. Um, what they do is they take uh, numerical representations of people's opinions and project them down a lower dimensional space so they can be analyzed and the relationship between uh, um, people's opinions um, uh, become more obvious. And the, the system was used by Fujitsu, General Motors, and um, the State Department to, to find insightfulness for uh, big questions that they had. Um, another system that was developed by our lab is called Cone, which is a collaborative observatory uh, for taking pictures of birds. Uh, the birds are identified through crowdsourcing, and uh, they've been able to use uh, this system uh, with thousands of internet users um, to find birds that were not uh, observed there by traditional means before. Um, the Automation Lab is also uh, really interested in uh, robotic motion planning. Uh, right now, in particular, uncertain grasping and uh, in surgical robotics to um, help make uh, surgery uh, more accessible and more reliable. Now, uh, my own research is in a uh, form of radiation therapy for cancer called brachytherapy. And uh, we focused on prostate cancer because it's a big healthcare concern for men. 
So in brachytherapy, uh, radiation is delivered directly to the tumor site using um, in needles that are inserted into the body. The idea is to deliver um, as much radiation as possible to the tumor and the prostate without over-irradiating other organs that are nearby. So clearly there are uh, many side effects related to um, poking people with needles, um, and these uh, side effects can have um, a, s a negative impact on the post-treatment uh, quality of life. So the goal of my research is to um, in reduce side effects by uh, the improved planning of brachytherapy. In particular, we want to take a patient's anatomy and put it into a needle planner, which will compute a configuration of needles which covers the, the prostate without poking anything that it's not supposed to. Then we take that uh, needle configuration and we put it into a dose planning system, uh, which calculates a dose distribution that uh, will treat the cancer. So on the left here, we show a uh, needle configuration that was actually implanted by a physician. And on the right is one that was um, computed by our system. Uh, they use the same number of needles. Both needle configurations were able to um, meet all the treatment objectives, and the number of, but, but the number of punctures uh, from the computed needle configuration was zero, while the physician punctured something uh, bad eight times. So what we've done is uh, the next step was to turn these computationally generally generated plans into reality. And for that, we used um, a robotic needle insertion device that was um, developed at John Hopkins. Here we see one of my lab mates uh, inserting a needle in one of the configurations we computed at times eight speed into a uh, phantom, so fake organs. Um, he has no experience in clinical brachytherapy, but um, he was still able to uh, <laughs> put in a uh, needle configuration which is on par with a physician with decades of experience. Um, so in the future, I'd like to take some of the things we've learned about uh, brachytherapy and extend them to other kinds of radiation therapy, such as gamma knife, which is used to treat brain lesions, and uh, intensely modulated radiation therapy, which is uh, used to treat a large number of cancers but is um, very difficult to plan. So uh, if you want to hear more about what we do at the Automation Lab, uh, please come visit us at Sudark the fourth floor of Sudark Shaddai Hall. It's uh, on the corner of Hearst and Leroy, or near there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ricky Muller. I'm representing the Berkeley Wireless Research Center, or BWRC. And today I'm going to talk to you about putting electronics in the brain. Is moving things with your mind science fiction or science? Science fiction has long been fascinated by tapping into the brain to control devices, enhance our minds or senses, or even create other selves. But while some of these applications may seem a bit far-fetched, we are working on neural implants today for some important clinical applications. So imagine you're in a car accident, and you suffer a catastrophic spinal cord injury of your C4 vertebra. This would render you paralyzed from the neck down. Now today, in terms of mobility and autonomy, you have very few options, and chances are you'll be dependent on another person for the rest of your life just to perform daily tasks. Brain-machine interfaces offer the hope to restore mobility and communication, not just to patients of spinal cord injury, but also to patients of traumatic brain injury, amputees, stroke, and many other debilitating neurological conditions. Now, this is one example of a neural interface, and that's that of a brain-machine interface or a brain-computer interface. And the way that this works is that you implant microelectrode arrays directly in the motor cortex of the brain. Signals are then acquired and sent out of the body to a computing element, which decodes these signals, then uses an algorithm to trace a 3D trajectory through space, which is then used to control a robotic prosthetic arm. Now, let me show you an example of this in action. Hopefully, okay. So this is a video from beautiful work that was taken um, from a paper published in Nature in 2008. This shows a restrained primate, and signals are recorded directly from the motor cortex of the primate and used to control the robotic prosthetic arm with four degrees of freedom. That's three spatial dimensions and one additional dimension to open and close the grabber arm. And the primate's able to feed itself from anywhere in a 3D space. And the question that I'm going to pose to you is what are they not showing us in this video? And the obvious answer should be that they're not showing us 
what's behind this metal column here? Or more specifically, what is this cable attached to? Uh, the tools used for brain machine interfaces today are large, bulky, wired, require open skull operation, and this leaves patients at risk of infection and unable to move. Ultimately, we want to transition these devices into a much smaller form factor uh, and make them wireless so that we can implant them in the, in the patient, close up the surgical site, and give quality of life back to these patients. As shown to the right are two such devices that we're developing at the Berkeley Wireless Research Center. And these devices integrate functionality onto a single chip together with electrodes and an antenna so that we can record the signal, transmit them out of the brain wirelessly, and also power the device wirelessly through RF. And the ultimate vision of this project is to make these devices so small and minimally invasive that the patient can actually have them implanted in their brain throughout the course of their lives. Now, in order to realize these devices, we've had to develop um, some of the world's smallest and most power efficient uh, wireless sensor technology. And if you'd like to find out more of the technical aspects of the project, please come visit us at our poster session. Now, obviously, we don't only work on neural implants. Uh, neural implants are one uh, example of a project um, of energy-efficient wireless systems, but we work on a wide range of projects from uh, advanced spectrum utilization, RF and millimeter wave circuits, uh, circuit design in leading-edge technologies, as well as reconfigurable hardware systems. Um, so please come join us at our poster session and our lunch in 250 Sitar Jedi Hall, and thank you very much for your attention. Well, we started off today bringing uh, graduate students back uh, who graduated about 25 years ago and giving them awards. I've been around long enough. I remember when they were just like those people. I can't help but think if I get to be around 25 years from now to the beginning of the session, we're going to see some of these people get those awards. Uh, that, that they were, uh, we did 11 talks in 55 minutes. They, they got five minutes each. It's 12.25. A great group. So let's give one more hand. Uh, they're still up here. The faculty who talked earlier will be at the, at the lunches. So, Come and meet the graduate students or head over for lunch, and we hope you have a great afternoon. <laughs>